Hi folks, welcome to another edition of Government Matters. My name is Mike Dobbs. Focus Springfield is presenting a series of interviews with the four announced candidates for mayor of the city of Springfield. And with me is David Chompy. Um, this format of interviews is very simple. I ask the same questions to all of the candidates, sort of giving you a baseline of information um, to, to listen to compare to their answers. So thanks for joining us today, appreciate it. You're welcome. And the first question is uh, sort of hypothetical, but yet I think it's, it's sort of interesting. And that is, if you're sitting down with Governor Healy, what would you say to her about the needs of the city of Springfield, the help that the state could give us, um, and information that you would want her to know about Springfield? There are multiple, um issues with Springfield. We have drug issues, we have uh, uh, weapons here, a lot of illegal guns. Um, there's drug issues. The drug issues, um, I have a new model for the drug issues. And what we have right now for a model really doesn't work. And so one of the top priorities would be to talk to Governor Healy about the, um, about what I think we should have for a pilot program for a new drug program. Uh, what we have right now, we have a methadone clinic, we have methadone clinics here, and, and the success rate, the treatment success rate is very low. And uh, in 20 years, there's only one person that I know of that actually got off methadone and became free of it. And so um, there's a new pilot program that was done in Europe involving uh, a six-month program. And uh, these folks would go into this program, they'd be off the streets in this program for six months. The first two weeks they'd be dealing with the medical issues surrounding the chemical dependencies. And then after that, they would start fo the staff would start focusing on the psychosocial, vocational, nutritional needs of each of these patients. And then when it's time to reintegrate them back into society, they would be reintegrated in a place where they didn't come from. That way they would start anew. They would have an opportunity to um, uh, have daily structure and not have that network easily available to them where they know the drug dealers and the drug dealers know them. So that's one of the issues. Another would be um, a new initiative for crime fighting and that would be Springfield 360. And as we move along, I'll be talking you, to you about that, uh, that initiative for fighting crime. There's been pilot programs, and despite some of the local police departments that didn't think that it would work, it turns out that it actually worked. But the key is you have to develop really genuine partnerships with uh, the community. And uh, if you don't have that faith, and you don't have that strong connection, it's gonna be pretty difficult to fight crime on any level. Okay. So that, that's just two things, and then there's other, um, there's other models in terms of mental health care, how are we gonna be dealing with mental health care? Uh, you know, 45 minutes an hour a week really doesn't really do much for people that are struggling with really deep, complex issues. So we really need to rethink how we take care of the people. And then of course, poverty is another issue. So poverty, mental illness, drug issues, these are metrics that I would be really focused in on as mayor. And I would be collaborating uh, with teams here in Springfield, as well as in Boston, because for some of this, we're gonna need to have state and federal aid. Springfield can't do this all by itself. Okay, next question has to do with uh, the cannabis industry. Um, Springfield, has been um, has been characterized as a place that's not been really friendly for dispensaries and friendly for manufacturing and cultivation, despite the fact that um, the people of Springfield voted to have cannabis here. So if, if you're mayor, what would you do about looking at um, conceivably increasing the cannabis industry's presence in Springfield? Because um, we are getting, every community that has it is getting 
um, tax money from the dispensaries, yes. um, which has proven to be very helpful. What would your stance be on that? Well, uh, I have, well, one thing is social responsibility. I don't have any problem with cannabis. I don't smoke, never did, but I have no problem with it. I'd rather see people smoking cannabis in a safe environment, not on the road, you know, in safe environments where they're not going to pose a danger to themselves and other people. Um, I have no problem with that. I'd rather see them smoking or using cannabis products than using benzodiazepines because, as you know, benzodiazepines are addictive. And once people get on it, my God, it's very difficult to wean them off of it. So I don't have an issue with that at all. Um, I, I think that uh, there are some issues. I understand Connecticut is going to be legalizing marijuana. There's going to be dispensaries there, yes. from what I understand. And also, I understand that a lot of people were coming up from New York State, from New York City and Connecticut to Springfield. But the game's going to change, and now why come up to Springfield when you can just go to Greenwich, Connecticut, or just over the border and get what you want? So uh, we have to think of new ways on how we can attract people to cannabis uh, dispensaries here. And um, because that industry does bring in a lot of taxable revenue, and it does help people out. Uh, the, the problem is with any kind of industry, you're going to have some misuse. And so I think the proof in the pudding is going to be how do we find ways where we can have cannabis used but not in ways that pose public health or public safety issues for other people. Okay. A lot of people have talked about the focus of economic development being in the downtown area for the last 20 to 30 years, frankly. A lot of people also say that we have, should have economic development efforts in our 17 neighborhoods. As mayor, what would you do to try to spread the economic development uh, initiatives throughout the city? One of the, and I stumbled on this purely by accident 10 years ago when I was in Rio de Janeiro. I came in contact with some of the carnival leaders, and over time, over the years, I got to know many of them. And uh, there's 15 samba schools. I know people from most of them. And it brings in a lot of money to Rio. Rio de Janeiro, you've got two groups of people, those that have, and they have a lot, and those that have nothing, and most of the population really has nothing. And so what can you do to bring money in and disperse it in ways that it benefits all the communities. And each of the Samba schools, which are basically civic associations, they come from different neighborhoods, from poor neighborhoods, basically. And the people that join these, uh, these Samba schools, um, they compete with each other during carnival, and whoever makes, whoever wins, uh, the competition, there's money that goes that way. You have corporations, you have um, varieties of different donors that provide economic support to Carnival every year. And then, of course, you have the foreign tourist individuals that really home in on Rio, and they all come in, they come in with tourist dollars. And that's what really feeds uh, Rio de Janeiro's economy. It's one of their major, uh, one of their major economic engines to the tune of about $750 million in one month. So that's pretty sizable. We're not going to get that here in Springfield. Springfield is very small when you look at the square mile, mileage of Springfield. But, so you have to scale it down. But nonetheless, you're bringing in a lot of money. And that money can be dispersed to different neighborhoods. Uh, some of the primary uh, economic beneficiaries would be small business. Uh, it would be transportation, it would be restaurants, um, liquor uh, industries, and, and all of that. So um, with that influx of money and that influx, that surge of population, it's going to come with problems. People are going to come in, there could be problems. So we really have to think about the public safety issues and how are we going to have law enforcement make sure that people don't come in with weapons or anything that can really hurt people. So there's many, many different layers to this, logistic concerns, all kinds of stuff, infrastructure. And, and so, but over time, I believe it's going to build. 
and when it builds, there'll be a synergistic effect, there'll be a lot of spin-offs. Now, in terms of how it's gonna benefit individuals, here's the thing. Somber, uh, the carnival's going to require um, costume makers, gonna require float makers. There's so much that's going to, labor is gonna to have to come into this to really pay for putting on such a uh, magnificent performance. How do you do this? And, and so there's a lot that goes into this, but really people can benefit from this. And I've seen it firsthand in Rio for many years. And um, so is it going to be um, the only thing that's going to raise the boats and solve the problems, the economic problems of the city? No, it's not. But it's one piece of an overall puzzle of, of different things that will come together. And um, so I think that will really move Springfield in a real good direction. Um, and of course, you don't get social renewal without economic renewal. Everything's tied together. So we have to think a little bit out of the box on this. Um, but there's more thinking involved in Carnival than simply the economics. And that's bringing people together of all walks of life, um, interracial groups, uh, people of different cultures. And if you can um, create a situation where people have a good time, well, their fear of difference is going to diminish and people will be more, um, more accepting of people. Uh, but you have to be able to provide them with uh, something positive or they're not going to, you know, it won't resonate with them at all. Okay. So the next question has to deal with <clears throat> something that um, was a very significant fight here in the city of Springfield. And that fight was over the creation of a civilian police commission. Um, you're probably aware that the city council wanted to do this. The mayor said that they didn't have the authority. The subsequent legal battle went all the way to the state Supreme Court. So the question is, are you, as a Springfield resident and now as a mayoral candidate, are you satisfied with the performance of the police commission as it, as it has been operating? No, I'm not. No, I'm not, uh, because when you look around, uh, some, there was a problem with some of the people that were convicted, I believe, and they were reinstated. I don't know where that status is now, whether or not they've been removed from the police force or not. But again, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with perceptions. And you can't fight crime if you don't create an atmosphere where people feel they can trust the police and they can trust the city government. And uh, it, it's easy to get people initially to trust, but once that trust is broken, it's very difficult to go back and repair things. So this is one of the reasons why I think we need new leadership in Springfield. Um, I believe that, look, my uncle was chief of police in East Hampton, Danny Gallagher, and I spent a lot of time with Danny, um, and Danny told me that you know, policing is a very difficult profession. Uh, it's one of, probably one of the hardest jobs in the country. Uh, but it's so necessary. We need our police. And we need our police to protect uh, the people of the city. And without police, we're in a, a big trouble. We're in really big trouble. So the question is, how can we make things better? How can we create an image and improve uh, the police department in ways that we all can be very happy, we can trust them. And when there is a crime, people, witnesses, will come forward and they won't be worried about saying who was the perpetrator. Okay? But we have to have initiatives for that. Um, in some cities, they have um, a, a fund available for witnesses that if you, say some, if you see something, you say something. And if there's, it results in a felony conviction, then what happens is they get an award. And in some cases, it can be thousands of dollars. So there are different ways how we can play this to um, build trust and confidence in the people that live in our city. And, but it's all going to, there has to be a multi-pronged approach to all of this. There's no one, one pathway that you can do this and really succeed. Uh, there's so many social forces here involved. You have gangs, you have all kinds of problems that are contributing uh, to the crime. So we have to approach this and we have to tailor our approach in ways that make sense. And um, I don't have all the answers. I think everyone in the city, they have something to bring to the table. 
And so uh, to talk, to collaborate, I think that's a very important thing to have open communications with the council, uh, the city councilors, and develop a relationship with them where it's not based on confrontation, it's based on cooperation. Okay, well this question sort of leads into the previous question, which is, are you satisfied with the performance of Superintendent of Police Cheryl Clapperwood? The, basically, the superintendent of police serves at the pleasure of the mayor. So whoever is the next mayor would have to evaluate whether or not uh, uh, the superintendent should continue in her position. What do you think about that? Well, I believe that she's going to retire next year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I've met her several times at Mercy Hospital. There'll be homeless meetings. I don't know if it was continuum of cure, but there was meetings over at uh, Mercy Hospital and I attended them. And, and um, I think she's a decent lady. I have great respect for her. Um, but again, this is not really about me, my thinking. It's about the city and where the city is with all of this. And there's been so much problems with abuse, violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, the report that came out from the Department of Justice. I mean, there's just so much. And, and it really taints people's perceptions of uh, the police department. And, but this, the police department is very pivotal. Law enforcement is very pivotal to trying to create stability. And we have problems with guns, gun trafficking, people coming in with automatic weapons, and they have no business with them to begin with. And the only thing that they can do is really hurt and maim people. So we have to get a handle on all of this, but none of this is gonna, there's, there's a common denominator with all of this, and that is establishing genuine uh, partnerships between the city government and the people. And I feel that has been basically severed in many respects. And, but we have to rebuild that. Um, and, and I think Springfield and New York City um, are two cities that have a lot of similarities. I mean, uh, Mayor Sano came in at a time when the city was basically just about bankrupt. And then we had the tornado here, uh, much like the Koch administration in New York City. Uh, in the 1970s, that city was floating in democracy, they were floating in bankruptcy as well. And violence and aggression and crime was committed every day. It was really a mess in New York City. Uh, but then Giuliani came in, he had an iron fist approach to dealing with crime, and he started cleaning things up, particularly on 8th Avenue uh, and 42nd Street with all the porn shops and everything. He had a way of cleaning that up. So um, I, I think Mersano did a really good job in helping the city out uh, at a time that the city needed it. But I think that there needs to be a new chapter in Springfield, and, um, and I, I just think it's that time. Okay. Our next question. So the mayor of Springfield is also the chair of the school committee. And I was wondering, you know, if you were elected, what would you, your priorities be for our school district, which is now the second, in the second largest in the state? One of the education is really at my heart. Um, I've spent a lot of time in schools and, um, and worked with some of the most gifted mentors in the country. I was very, very, um, I was very, very lucky in many ways. But we have to think of the social environments where a lot of these uh, children are at in the city and how we can help them maximize their potential in life. I was working with someone today in Northampton who told me that in fourth grade, uh, people started giving him marijuana and then by fifth grade he was watching pornography, okay? Um, that's not a healthy, that's not a psychological healthy type of environment and it's not so much the schools, it's the people that are coming into the schools that may be having a lot of difficulties in their home environment. They may have broken families, uh, they may have fathers or mothers that uh, abuse them. Uh, physically, sexually, you name it. But the damage that happens to people tends to happen in childhood when young people are most vulnerable. And how do we fix that? And what, does, what role does a school have? What role does public education have in helping young people move on? Now, when I was young, I went to a school in Springfield, public school until the third grade. And I was diagnosed with a learning disability, a, spe a serious speech, uh, disorder. Mm -hmm. The only person supposedly who could understand me was my dad. And 
Um, and I was told in third grade, the principal got me into his office, remember his name, remember the day, 58 years, 60 years later, he told me, you're champion, you're gonna be a complete failure in life. Well, that's setting me on a life trajectory that doesn't look pretty. Governor John Volpe of Massachusetts, through someone who advocated, I don't know who it was, I suspect it was Dr. Smith down at Springfield Hospital. Springfield Hospital is now um, Bay State Medical Center, but it used to be Springfield Hospital. And um, Governor Volpe decided to spend Massachusetts taxpayer money to get me out of the Springfield Public School System, and I went to the Devereux Foundation in Rutland, Massachusetts. It was a boarding school. I was in a classroom with six, seven other children, and I had robust behavioral health care. Now, the learning disability that I had, the speech disorder that I had, that was not in my DNA. That wasn't in my DNA. I was abused coming back from school, back to my house, I was being physically assaulted by older kids who had anger issues. And they, they couldn't take it out on their dad or their mom, so they took it out on other younger kids that couldn't defend themselves. Well, after you get so many beatings after a while, that's gonna affect your ability to internalize information, learn, and excel. And so this is where I was at, but the school couldn't see that. So to answer your question, what we really need to do is deal with the psychosocial issues of these kids as well. And how, because schools in my mind are instruments of socialization. Schools are instruments of socialization, churches are, um, the police are. I mean, they serve a deterrent. If you do something bad, you're gonna be accountable for it, and there's consequences, and the consequences aren't necessarily that good. But getting back to the schools, we really need to be able to instill in young people a sense of respect for oneself, for other people. Uh, so you come with the question of social, emotional, civic education. I think these curricula is gonna be very significant, and very important to prepare childhood for adulthood. So for those people that transition from childhood to adulthood and most well, we want to make sure, I want to make sure that they have all the tools necessary to be able to navigate through life with a minimal amount of problems and to be resilient, uh, to be able to pick yourself up after you take a fall and be able to, you know, keep your chin up, try to smile and try to move ahead in a goal that's going to not only benefit your life, but benefit those around you. And if we can do that, I think over time, we're gonna have a completely different social landscape. Okay. Uh, we're sitting right here as part of the MGM uh, complex. Uh, MGM has been in the news a great deal lately uh, with uh, the CEO, Bill Hornbuckle, coming in to visit a couple weeks ago, declaring that they had underestimated the Springfield, or overestimated the Springfield market as an excuse why they're not living up to the host community agreement in terms of jobs and amenities at the casino. Uh, granted, they are opening some things back up, but whoever's mayor of Springfield is the person who really has to try to enforce the host community agreement to make sure that this facility is living up to its promises. If you're elected mayor, is that gonna be a concern for you? I want, yes, I wanna make sure that the MGM is holding up to their agreements with the city uh, because that's a source of revenue, it's a revenue stream. So I wanna make sure that revenue stream is not broken. Um, how can we, but I look at MGM as a partner with the city of Springfield. They're one of our partners and how do we, how do we strengthen that relationship and how can we strengthen it in a way that economically benefits both of us? And um, I think one of the major pieces to this is tourism, bringing people in and, and giving them a reason to come to Springfield. And uh, we have to change the perceptions that people have of Springfield. We have incredible resources here. We have uh, Springfield, one of the oldest cities in the country. Uh, we have a lot that we can offer people that come to Springfield. And, um, and we have great opportunities with the Rio de Janeiro and um, so I, I, think, I think the future looks really bright for the city, but it's going to take a lot of collaboration, a lot of work, and, and working in a way that benefits us all. Okay, we got a little bit of time left, so it's time for the bonus question. And that bonus question is, can you tell people why you want to run for mayor at this time? 
I see a lot of people, I'm on the front row, I see a lot of people suffering. In this city, we have two kinds of people, those that have and those that have not. And it seems like those that have are doing pretty well, but it's the have-nots. They're the ones that are having the problems. They're the ones that suffer from uh, poverty. And poverty is really, in my mind, I know we, when you think of poverty, you think in economics, a lack of economics, but I look at it as a social disease because it's a package deal. When you're poor, it's not just that you don't have money, it's all the other issues, the stress, the anxiety, the, the, uh, the violence. I mean, being poor, you're not gonna have the resilience to be able to co recover because you don't have access to all the uh, resources available to you like people that have money would have. And people that are poor typically don't live as long as people that have money. I mean, that's the statistics. I mean, people that are poor, that have nothing, they don't seem to go through life very well and very long. And so we need to change that because if all of us don't live well, none, at some point none of us are going to live well. Uh, we have instances where people are walking on other people's, uh, they're going up to other people's houses and they're taking items uh, from individual porches and this has been going on for a long time. But how do we fix this? And we have to be able to fix this by giving people hope. And when I work with people, I see a lot of detachment. I see a lot of people that are detached. And I asked myself, you know, years ago, I mean, my God, what's going on here? Why are these people so detached? And it suddenly occurred to me that no one bothered to really invest in them. I know it's a two-way street. You got to fight for what you want. But uh, when you're young, if nobody's investing in you and you're being told you're going to be a failure in life, you know, a lot of young people, they don't have the motivation to do anything else. They look around, they see their friends, they see their mothers or fathers going in and out of jail. I mean, it, it, it begins, to, it looks like, you know, well, that's the way you get socialized in our country by going into jail. No, that's not. Okay, we got to be able to change this narrative. And again, it's going to uh, require an approach where the problems of the city are going to be approached in a multi-pronged way to be able to address the problems, to be able to give people hope. And I mean, hope is a really important thing. And, um, and one of the reasons I'm becoming, I want to become mayor of Springfield is because people, I believe people can change. People can change. They have the capacity for positive change. I've seen it. I've worked with people that other folks have just given up on them. They say, well, you know what? Uh, this individual is beyond my service capability. I like that word, those words, beyond my service capability, and they walk away from them. And I don't walk away from people. I will work with them because some of the miracles do happen with individuals. The moment you walk away from an individual, that's basically it you're not gonna make any progress with them. It's only through engagement. It's only through engagement that we can change the narrative of the city and get people to trust city government, trust our police, uh, but it's a two-way street. And, and when we can get to a place where people trust each other, then if someone sees a crime, chances are they're gonna speak up and say, hey, look, this person has a gun. This person is dealing with drugs. And, and the problem with the drug issue is you're never gonna solve the supply unless you deal with the demand. As long as the demand's there, you're gonna have people filling the roles to sell the drugs. So we have to, ha like I said, have a multi-pronged approach. These are very complex and deep issues. And it's not just a problem for Springfield. It's a Springfield's a mirror image of what's happening in the country. And so, uh, but you know, everything, politics is local and we have to start dealing with things here in Springfield. And if we can do it in a way that actually um, gains traction, then we, our city could be a model for other cities throughout the country. But we need to focus on the solutions. I'm not really interested too much in the problems. We all know what the problems are. Okay. Well, thanks for coming by. Thanks for giving us some answers. Thank you. And folks, You've been watching Government Matters here on Focus Springfield in our series of interviews with the four men so far who have identified themselves as candidates for the mayor of Springfield. Thanks very much for watching.